You're listening to This Week in America with Rick Bratton. Welcome back, everybody. This Week in America online, thisweekinamerica.us. Standalone is the true story of a young man of great promise and potential whose life was changed on a Missouri highway when he was severely injured and by all medical probabilities should have died. The young man is Matthew Duke Rogers. His story is one of inspiration and hope, faith, perseverance, determination, how love can overcome even the most downy expectations of man. He reveals the struggles endured by a person with a traumatic brain injury from the time of his injury through his struggles to graduate from the University of Missouri. Matthew Duke Rogers, author of the heartwarming book, Stand Alone, is our guest on This Week in America. Duke, welcome to the program. It's great to have you with us today. Great to be here, Rick. Thank you. This is such a powerful story, and let's go back and, and pick it up at the beginning and talk about what all you've gone through in the limited time that, that we do have. Let's go back to uh, May 15th, 1989. I understand you've been home a couple of weeks from college, finished up your freshman year. That night really changed the rest of your life. Talk about what happened that night. Oh, I... I went out with a couple of high school football buddies. I played football and wrestled in high school and just to shoot pool, have a couple of beer, beers. There was really no point to the evening. When I got done going out with the guys, I went home, checked into my mother to let her know I was home, then I snuck back out. Uh, I didn't need I didn't need a curfew. I was nineteen years old. Um, but my mother was kinda like a drill sergeant. She had six <laughs> I have five brothers and sisters, six kids in my family, but, and I used to do it all the time in high school, I would sneak back out and set my own curfew as long as I got home before her dad woke up, but I, I never made it back into town. I was in a single car automobile accident. Yeah, you were like, what, five miles, less than five miles away from home, so this was familiar territory. Do you remember much about the accident? Uh... I've strained myself over the years to try and remember, and, and from what the police report said, I was I was in the southbound lane on Highway 371, and I was I was driving an estimated 90, 95 miles an hour, and I went around a curve. I was in the southbound lane, and I went around a curve, and I tried. There had to be something out on the road because the police speculated. If I had lost control or fallen asleep, I would have sailed straight through the curve. But I didn't. I wrecked into the curve. And and they asked, when I came out of a coma, they asked me what it, my parents did, my mom did, and I said it was in the road. It's some big brown, like a deer or a cow or something. Anyway, the car tore up the, the, the ditch for about, the police report said, Investigation at the scene found the vehicle number one left the roadway and traveled 328.3 feet to find a rest, at which point the driver was vaulted slash ejected from the vehicle at a distance of 75 feet, landing on the roadway in the Sapine Lane of Highway M371. That's just in the story in the book Standalone, you talk about the doctor saying that uh, uh, you were still alive. He told your parents, and we'll talk about that, that story when he met with them here in a second, but you were still alive. He didn't know how, and you shouldn't be. And he compared the impact when you hit the ground to that of someone diving out of an eight-story building. Uh, most people didn't think you'd be uh, be alive to morning, until morning, did they? No, no, not at all. Um, yeah, it's Dr. Webb... I interviewed him when I decided I was going to write a book, and, and this was a lot of years after the accident, but he remembered a lot of it, and yeah, there was no medical reason for me to be alive. I was a three on the Glasgow coma scale. I'm, I'm, I don't mean to be jumping ahead, but we've got a very short time to talk, I know. Um, it... He, he, yep. When my family was there in the waiting room, mom said the waiting was what was the hardest part. But after several hours, 
he showed up wishing to speak to my parents. Well, Dad hadn't gotten there yet. He was at his ranch where I live and work now, and my family moved two years later. But he had a, a, a farm in Platte City, Missouri, just north of KCI Airport in Kansas City. And then he has a 6,000-acre ranch in Huntsville, Missouri, where I live now. We sell hunting and fishing, outdoor recreation, all that stuff. But um, that's why you see all the deer heads in the back. Yes, in the video portion, we see that uh, you're out there and enjoying the uh, the hunting in that area. We're talking about the book Standalone, Matthew Duke Rogers, R-O-D-G-E-R-S, is the author and our guest in the program. You'll find the book available at bookventure.com, at uh, Amazon. We'll talk about uh, availability of the book uh, on the program. It's a really inspirational read. And you, you talk about uh, your mom being there, meeting with the doctor. Your mom is telling herself and others that you were in the Lord's hands and his alone uh, reminded everybody that you already had made a, a personal choice for, for Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. Talk about that because so much of this, not only you getting through, but your family getting through this period, really relied on, on that belief, that religion, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. It relied on, on the faithfulness of the Lord. If if you read, I, I, was, I stayed up all night trying to think of the quickest way to describe the book to you. Um, or to your, the audience. And the preface, in the preface I say, every individual has events in their life that cause them to consider eternity. It may be the death of a loved one, a natural disaster leaving thousands dead, or a terrorist attack killing innocent bystanders. We all wonder what's next. Is there life after we die and how do we get it? There are many different belief systems that claim to be the way, the way to eternal life. Are they all right? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me, John 14, 6. Is that true? The Apostle Paul said he would not presume to speak about anything other than what the Lord did through him, resulting in people coming to know and follow the Lord, Romans 15, 18. And then I talk about, I was in a car wreck on a dark, lonely highway after midnight on May 15, 1989, Mother's Day. The police report stated I was vaulted slash ejected from the car 75 feet, landing back on the highway. The emergency room doctor found I had landed only on my head, resulting in six skull fractures and a traumatic brain injury. A miracle rescue followed in the wreck in which both my breathing and heart had to be restarted before being flown by life flight to North Kansas City Hospital. I wouldn't want anyone to have to go through the wreck and everything that resulted from it. I would wish the experience on everyone who answer to the eternal security life debate. That's why I wrote Stand Alone. It will remove all doubt because eternity is too long to be wrong. And that really and I, sums up, doesn't it, what, uh, what the book is about, what your your message is about and the message that you have for people that uh, are interested in your story and wonder how you got through this. You, you really lay it all out there for us, don't you? Yes, sir. I, I, I don't hold anything back, anything like that. Um, short, my mother said that shortly after I came out of a coma, on page 21, second paragraph. Uh, Mom said that as I started to come out of the coma, I began to whisper that I had been with the Lord. I said I was with him twice. The first time we were in the meadow, I said I remember green grass like a lake or a pond. I told her Jesus had brown hair and was wearing a robe. I said the second time I was with him, we were at the gates. Mom asked me what they looked like, and I said, they're real tall, and everything was golden glowing, and the Lord had white hair. I told her, Jesus talked to me about sin in my life. He told me my baby is with him. Uh, she didn't have a clue what I was talking about. When the story got related to my older sister, then it became clear. When I was a freshman in high school, I dated an older girl that could drive and 
It's made things a lot easier. To make a long story short, I lost my virginity and she got pregnant and had an abortion. And my mother was real heavy in the pro-life movement at that at that time in her life and she was heartbroken to find out her first grandchild was aborted um i didn't i didn't i didn't tell hardly anybody about it and i don't know how but when your mother is is picking in picketing abortion clinics, Planned Parenthood and stuff like that. And it really makes you think as an individual, I guess. The truth is a common question that people ask me is whether I remember seeing the Lord or what I, what do I remember anything from that? I said, I don't know. I think I can, but it might just be the power of suggestion. The truth is, Coming out of a coma is not like waking up in the morning, you know. You know, I had to relearn how to walk yes. again, how to talk yes. again. And yeah, and there if is, you, yeah, it's interesting I'm sorry. that you you talk about that because for most people they think it is sort of like waking up. That that wasn't the case, and you describe that in the book Standalone. Matthew Duke Rogers, our guest on the program. Books available at bookventure.com and the bookstore. It's available at Amazon as well. Uh, so much to talk about. And you mentioned the uh, the abortion. And this lady, with, for what, three years, wrote you a letter. And this really had an impact on your life at the time, didn't it? Oh... Oh, it, it was a letter apologizing for any part she had in it, and I kept it for years, you know, because it was I was always on my mind, you know. I mean, the the abortion and stuff like that. I mean, abortion is is legal, illegal, whatever, like that. There's still there still are, will be doctors that, that perform abortions. The truth is, before Roe versus Wade, abortions were happening in our country. And that was in 1973. And technology had not advanced far enough to prove it, was, it wasn't just a, a blob of tissue or is it a live baby or what. But since then... And, you know, 1973, there weren't even cell phones or anything like that. But my brother, my youngest brother, Kevin, him and his wife just had a baby girl that was born uh, after, I want to say, 27 weeks is what he told me because I asked him mm. this morning. <gasps> about what it was she she was in an incu in, had to be incubated for a long time which is a very expensive procedure but now she's the she's just turned five years old and she's the oh, fantastic you know, the joy of of him and, and and his wife melissa's life oh i'm sure but it's with, with uh, abortion is on is on a lot of people in our country's mind because every time a Supreme Court nominee comes up, well, is he going to overturn Roe or this or that or whatever, you know, and, and people are almost crazy about it. But the truth is, when a play, and I talk about it in the book. You talk about it, yeah, extensively in the book, and the book is Standalone, Matthew Duke Rogers, the author, and our guest on the program, The Miraculous Story of perseverance, determination, faith, uh, revealing his struggles endured by a person with traumatic brain injury. And uh, a few minutes left in the program, I want to talk about after you went through the 28 days in the coma, I think it was like a 15th month of rehab that you went through. You talk in the book very openly about the laws designed to protect and assist traumatic brain injury survivors, how they can be ignored by the very institutions that should have a willingness to, to educate and to train 
Uh, you talk about the issues when you were ready to go back to college, look for the accommodations that I think by law they, they had to give you. That was r another traumatic experience as well, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I, I know all about the federal court system, let's put it that way. Um, I, I, the last rehabilitation I was in was Rusk at the University of Missouri Hospital and Clinics. I started in, the, in their general therapies. It was the third rehab I was in over the next year. And I started in their, in their general therapies, but I soon graduated to their advanced uh, traumatic brain injury therapy called BURP. It stands for Brain Injury Rehab Program. Um, everybody in that was all at least one to two years post-accident, except for me. I was less than six months post-accident when I started in the BURP program. And when, when I was getting toward the end of, of that therapy, vocational rehabilitation, which is a a state-run part of the government, I think, they would help, they called us their clients, and they would help their, their clients, you know, send them to a job training program and then help them find a job. When they got to me, they asked me what I wanted to do. I said, I want to go back to school. And they said, well, Duke, we've never had anyone with your set of a head injury even attempt school, let alone be able to complete a degree. I, you know, I reminded them of my scholastic acumen, if anything, before the accident. I was finished with a fourth highest GPA in my senior class, the 3.938 on a four-point on scale. I was pre-accepted to law school out of high school. I was a Kansas City Star Scholar athlete from my high school, Platte County, R3, near Kansas City. Um... And they said, well, we'll let you audit two classes. And if you do good enough in those, then, yeah, we'll authorize that as your vocational goal and we'll pay for your school. And I said, okay, great. So I audited accounting 36, which is principles one at the University of Missouri, and logic, the study of arguments. Um, and I did well enough in those classes that they authorized that as my goal. Well, I was told to use the the uh, every university that is federally funded must have an office to assist people with disabilities. It was the ADA Act of 1990, which requires that. Well, I was told to use the access office is what they were called. Well, they knew what to do if, if you were in a wheelchair or blind or needed a a reader or writer for you or whatever, but they didn't know what to do for someone with a traumatic brain injury because they never had anyone. Yeah, you really stumped them because this was totally new to them. I've, I've got about two minutes left in the program. I, I hate to rush you with that story because you went through so much perseverance, your mother by your side, they're fighting for you to get what was yours. You ended up with the uh, uh, being able to graduate, as, as I mentioned, from the university. But if you didn't display that same perseverance, that same determination, that faith that you had as you were battling back from the traumatic brain injury after the accident, you know, that would not have happened. And I as we close, I, the name of the book is Stand Alone, and you you talk in the book about very active in, in working in, in missionaries uh, in Colombia, building a church there. The the book is so much more than just an accounting of the uh, of the accident and and what happened after that. It's a it's an excellent biography, very inspirational. Talk about the, where the name Stand Alone comes from. My story is not for religious people, country club Christians, or comparative Christians. They need to read the parable of, of the Pharisee and the tax gatherer, Luke 18, 9 through 14. I wrote this, I wrote the book originally for a few individuals, disabled people, and people I call the untouchables. Whether you're in a literal prison or an invisible one and condemned of a crime no one knows about, Know that Jesus cares about you, and he came to set the captives free. Luke 4.15 Another thing you can be sure of, when you stand before God in either prayer or judgment, if Jesus is not your Lord and Savior, you will stand alone.
and that is the name of the book, Standalone, Matthew Duke Rogers, R-O-D-G-E-R-S. The book's available uh, at the usual places, bookventure.com, and the bookstore there at, uh, at Amazon as well. Uh, available in, in several formats. The story of inspiration and hope to all people who sometimes struggle and question if God is there. Duke, it has been a pleasure to have you on the program. You are doing really, really well today, and I appreciate you taking the time going back and, and reliving and talking about your experiences because they are really are, are motivational and inspirational to so many people. Thank you for being with us on the program. Thank you, Rick. This has been a pleasure for me, too. It, once again, the book is Standalone, Matthew Duke Rogers, R-O-D-G-E-R-S. The book is available at bookventure.com and Amazon, other places as well. And you'll find those at our website, thisweekinamerica.us. We're back on today's program after these messages. <laughs> 